Let's start by recalling how our uh, general harmonic oscillator system looks. And I'm going to start here so that I can then look at a forced version of it, where there's a, an external force. And we've already looked at this, but I want to focus on specifically uh, a sinusoidal external force for this lecture. Okay, so let's start by deriving the uh, model differential equation for this thing. Um, so as usual, x will be displacement from equilibrium. There's some direction that we pick as, as positive x. And we just apply Newton's second law. So mass times acceleration equals the total force, which if there's no damping, so here I'm going to do undamped for now, and then we'll introduce the damping later. So undamped harmonic oscillator. Then the uh, mass times the acceleration is the total force, which is only coming from Hooke's law, so proportional to the displacement. Here k would be the spring stiffness. Okay, and then we can rewrite this like this to see that it's you know a linear. This is our sort of standard form for a linear second order uh, differential equation with constant coefficients, and it's homogeneous. So this is there's no external force here. Now, um, when you actually get the solution to this, you find that um, the quantity k over m is interesting. It comes out in the frequency. So uh, to, to see that, to see where that's coming from, you do your usual thing where you guess e to the lambda t as your solution, and then you get a characteristic polynomial, m lambda squared plus k equals 0, and then you get lambda equals, so you get minus k over m, square root. So square root minus k over m, that means plus minus square root k over m i. So here, that's because k and m are always positive. So square root of negative k over m would be negative, would be complex. So um, since you get complex roots, you get basically pure oscillation. So there's no real part. There's no exponential growth or decay part. You get pure oscillation with this frequency. And we call this natural frequency of the system. So let's just define this to be omega naught. Let's call this omega naught to simplify what our um, what our original differential equation looks like, and to make it so that our parameters here are more meaningful for what the final response of the system is going to be. So right now the parameters are meaningful; they stand for mass and spring stiffness. But remember this whole setup. So hang on, let me finish talking here before I change it. Remember, this whole setup is really about any situation where you have a restoring force. If you just do a Taylor approximation, a first order approximation, you can describe a restoring force as something like Hooke's law. Um, so even if, uh, you know, even if what's involved here is not spring stiffness, a differential equation like this could have, uh, could be useful for us to understand how it works, because it could describe the dynamics of other things than just this stupid little spring mass system. Um, and we have seen that even uh, the m standing for mass is not necessarily uh, something we have to uh, require for this to be useful, um, because with the RLC circuits, uh, we had sort of inductance sitting there, uh, playing a role similar to what mass plays. So what I'm going to do is div divide the entire thing by m. So I get k over m here. And then I'm just going to... I mean, this is the same differential equation, right? I just divided everything by m. 0 divided by m is m. So same differential equation, same solution. So um, we're going to get like a linear combination of cosine square root k over m t and sine square root k over m t in the end. Um, and we have identified this square root k over m quantity as the angular frequency of these so-called fundamental solutions. So this is the angular frequency. And so instead of focusing on m and k as, as though they are of really important constants, I'm going to focus on something that really has more to do with the response rather than the physics of this stupid little specific example. Let's focus on some a different naming of the parameters that really tells us about how the system responds, which is informative regardless of whether we're interpreting this as mass or inductance or whatever. So we favor, instead of k and m, we favor omega dot the angular frequency of the response of the system. So I'm going to erase this k over m and replace it by omega naught squared, because if I define square root k over m to be omega naught, 
then this here is omega naught squared. And one nice thing about writing it like this is now it's now I don't have to say anything about whether this is positive or negative. It's automatically positive just because it's a square of something. Um, so here, you know, technically we have to say we should point out unless the physics aspect is kept in mind, we should point out that uh, m and k are both taken to be positive there. Okay, so here is our equation, which you already knew, but I just want to uh, make it uh, feel more natural why we highlight specific parameters like omega naught rather than highlighting um, parameters like k and m. So this is our differential equation for an undamped um, harmonic oscillator. Undamped and let's call it unforced or undriven. So there's no external force. If there were an external force, then I would add it as another term here. Okay, and one thing you might be wondering here is why am I calling the uh, angular frequency in the fundamental solutions, why am I calling that omega naught? Why don't I just call it omega? Uh, that's because something else is going to be called omega uh, coming up in just a moment. So I'm calling this omega naught as sort of the like uh, base value of omega, and then we're going to try some other omegas. You'll see what I mean. Um, this is called the natural frequency. So this is the frequency with which this system, or whatever it is, whether it's a spring mass system or something else, the frequency with which it oscillates, the angular frequency, so in radians per unit time. So if you just let it go, don't touch it, don't put any external force on it, just let it wiggle in the way that it most naturally wants to wiggle, then this is the angular frequency. Omega naught is the angular frequency with which it will wiggle. Um, now suppose we apply an external force. So now I'm going to change things up. So suppose we stick our grubby hands into the system and start w forcing it to wiggle in a certain other way. So by forcing it, I don't mean um, like force its position to take different positions based on our whims. I mean, apply a force in the Newton's force laws kind of sense of force. So I mean, apply pushes and pulls in a sinusoidal kind of way. So not just, you know, we, we've been looking at kinds of different various kinds of things you can put on the right hand side here, different uh, forcing functions. Now I'm talking about specifically applying a force that is sinusoidal. So you wiggle it back and forth. Now you could choose any frequency to uh, wiggle it by. So you could use um, omega naught, the natural frequency, the frequency that it wants to wiggle with, or you can use uh, any other frequency that you that you choose. Okay, so if we apply a sinusoidal force with, so we push back and forth, sort of, and we do this with frequency omega, then we can do it with a certain frequency, we can do it with a certain amplitude, right? Um, by the way, in case it's not clear, this is my drawing of a hand. This is supposed to be a hand. So it's pushing back and forth the frequency omega, which might be different from omega naught, the natural frequency of this oscillator. You push, push back and forth the frequency omega, and you can also push hard or less hard, right? So that's like amplitude. Um, so uh, if you plot your applied force uh, in time, then you've got you can apply sort of a force with a low frequency or maybe a very high frequency, right? So that's one thing you can control, how fast you're wiggling it, maybe you could call that. And then there's how hard you're wiggling it. So you could apply a certain amplitude or you could apply a much larger amplitude even with the same frequency. So, you know, make the hardest of your pushes in any particular direction be harder and the hardest of your pushes in the other direction be harder. But there are still these same times, maybe, where your, your total push is zero at those instants. OK. So where does this factor into the differential equation? Um, again, Newton's laws, mass times acceleration, excuse me, equals the sum of the forces. Now we have an additional force in addition to Hooke's law, in addition to Hooke's law, which is um, this which is some amplitude, like some, uh, yeah, so this thing that I was plotting, this applied force with time, 
this is going to be like a sine omega t, right? And there might be a phase shift, so maybe it's say um, a sine omega t plus delta or something. But for simplicity, let's say it's a sine omega t. So let's say you start start your force at zero. Then here I would add a sine omega t. Then if I go here, um, I would be left with that function of t, explicit function of t on the right-hand side, rather than zero. But remember, I divided everything by m, so I guess it's a over m sine omega t. So this would now be an undamped but actually forced or driven harmonic oscillator. This is the kind of thing we want to study uh, for this lecture. Um, and then we also want to look at the damped version. So um, remember I kept, uh, in this lecture I keep using the word response, the response of the system. Um, remember I described that terminology uh, last time or maybe before that as uh, in the following way, that if, if you apply apply a force, so apply a right-hand side, like let's call it f of t, to an, a, a linear differential equation like this. So you choose what goes on the right-hand side, like choosing this function of t here. Then that is called an input. This is sometimes referred to as an input to the system because it's the thing that you control that you're doing to the system from the outside. Maybe it's the voltage source that you're, it's like a little knob that you control or something. This is your input to the system. Then if you solve the differential equation, then that will get you some kind of x of t, right, your solution. Uh, maybe general or maybe there were initial conditions and you get a specific solution. But this is called the response to the system. So the way to think about this uh, undamped forced harmonic oscillator is that um, the way to think about the omega naught versus the omega is the omega naught is the natural frequency of the system in the sense that if you input zero, that's the frequency with which it would oscillate. If you do nothing to it, then that's how it wants to oscillate. And um, the omega, on the other hand, is the frequency of the applied input rather than the frequency of the uh, that the response wants to have. Okay, so one. So how would you approach solving this differential equation? Um, this is non-homogeneous, so you'd use the methods discussed in the previous lecture. Uh, probably the method of undetermined coefficients. So. You know, you get the general solution to the homogeneous. So we sort of split it up into a few steps, right? Get the general solution to the homogeneous. Then get at least one, by any means necessary, get one solution to the non-homogeneous, um, and then add them. So that's what we do. Um, and depending on what value omega takes, we could get different uh, responses out of the system. Uh, this can be really interesting. So this is what I want to explore in this lecture. As we change what omega we put in, what, what omega we apply with our hands to the system, or by turning tuning a voltage or whatever it is, uh, how, how does the uh, response, uh, how does x respond? How does the system respond to different choices of omega? Um, so before I get into actually solving this, um, let me just uh, express that this is, uh, or let me just emphasize again, that this is, what we're discussing here is more general than just uh, this silly physics example where you have a mass on an actual literal spring and someone's hand coming in and pushing and pulling it. Um, so for example, uh, let's think about any situation where there's a restoring force. Uh, you could have like, um, a material that wants to keep a particular shape, but it's allowed to wiggle from from that shape. So one uh, example that is often brought up in the context of this discussion here is like a a wine glass wants to keep its shape, but it's allowed to wiggle a little bit. Um, if you uh, if a singer sings a particular note then that sound 
will be some kind of pressure wave that will apply a force to the um, to the wine glass and make it wiggle, right? Um, depending on the pitch of the uh, note, you could make it wiggle with different uh, amplitudes. And we know uh, from popular culture, I guess, that if you hit just the right note, maybe you can make it wiggle so much that it breaks. So this is kind of the idea that we're that we're going to explore. If you choose different frequencies, um, which might be different frequencies of a of a note, like different pitch of note that you're singing, um, of this forcing frequency, um, how how drastic will the response be? How much is the amplitude of the response? Okay, so let's get into that in the next video.